Hey, Reading Lens listeners, Jason Banzoff here, producer for the Group Talk Network of Podcasts. Over the next few months, we're going to be releasing some of Nick's favorite episodes that he has done. And while this is going on, Nick is getting some much-deserved rest and preparing for a new season coming up. What's exciting is that this new season comes with a brand new approach to his show. Stay tuned for what's ahead. Enjoy this Reading Lens classic. Welcome to Group Talk. Four shows, one podcast from the small group network focusing on topics relevant to small group ministries. Whether you're in a church of 100 or 10,000, whether you're a volunteer or staff, we want to support, encourage, and equip you to lead well. So relax, listen, and enjoy Reading Lens with Nick Lindsay. Hey, Small Group Network, welcome back to another episode of Reading Lens. We are so glad that you've chosen to take time to hang out with us. I'm Nick Lindsay, and it's an honor to be your host. If you're with us for the first time, welcome. We're so excited that you've joined us. Here's how Reading Lens works. Each month, I have a guest with us who is also a small group point person, share with you insights from books that we are reading and what our takeaways are and how we plan to incorporate them into our lives, leadership, or our small groups. To help me with today's book is Aaron Burton from Downtown Community Church in Jersey City, New Jersey. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Nick. Good to be here. Cool. So Aaron and I go way back. Um, Man, when did you start coming to Hoboken Grace? Was that 2013? It was eight years ago. I had a wow. one, two, and three-year-old at the time. Oh my gosh. I don't, yeah. I So I currently have a three-year-old and an eight-week-year-old and three, two, one is just that that boggles my mind. Yeah, but. well, I can remember how you probably feel right now. Yes, yes, uh, overwhelmed. So yep. if it, that's not coming across, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> awesome. So Erin uh, was a was a part of our church. Uh, her husband Wayne, who is fantastic, was one of our campus pastors at the time. Um, we had a we were multi site and we had a location in Jersey City, and then it came to a point where we 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 really just wanted to bring our family back into one location again, but we really just felt strongly that that Jersey city location could really continue to thrive and, and, you know, be able to understand their context better and be independent and probably helped because you were called Hoboken grace and you were meeting in Jersey city, which for those who aren't familiar, Jersey city and Hoboken have a kind of little unnecessary rivalry. It's true. (laughs) We call it no Boken. No Boken. Oh, Mm -hmm. Burn. <laughs> um, so, how would you describe Jersey City? Well, Jersey City is one of the most densely populated cities in the country, but also the most diverse city in the country. Yeah. Um, and it is characterized by who it's next to, which is Manhattan. Mm-hmm. So, we've been dubbed Wall Street West, the sixth borough. Yeah. But our history goes back to Ellis Island. It's, Ellis Island is part of Jersey City. So we we have been dominated by immigration through mm-hmm. our history. But it's still today what is in the forefront. 40% of Jersey City is foreign born. And my kids go to the most diverse school in the whole state. Wow. 44 languages are spoken in the homes of their school. That is awesome. They must be learning so much and and getting. They are. They celebrate a lot of holidays. Yeah. I went to Temple University, which is in Philadelphia. And that was what was called Diversity University. Because at the time that I was there, I don't even know if it still is. That's how poor of alum I am. But it was a most diverse school. And I remember how much I valued and I didn't go there for that intentions. But coming out of it, I just valued that so much of getting to learn, you know, about different cultures and getting to learn oh, we all don't have the same experiences. And, you know, that, that almost comes into today's book a little bit of, of we're going to get to learn about different personalities, and yeah. introverts and extroverts that, that we're going to get into. But before we move on, you know, I just want to ask, you know, what brought you to this area and what made you want to plant in Jersey City? Well, my pastor husband and I, <laughs> <laughs> we got married in 2007 and pretty quickly after that decided to move to New York City to be part of what we saw God doing in the church plants in yeah. New York. And we just love the city. We love culture and we had spent most of our early adulthood traveling the world and seeing how God was at work. He quit his job and we we moved to New York. And in that process, Wayne was hired by a church and they asked us to live in Jersey City. We did okay. not know Jersey City even existed prior to that point. Yeah. But moving here absolutely fell in love with the city in the place. Yeah. Um 
It was 2008 and it was six months before the stock market crash. So kind of walking through that time in Jersey City and seeing, you know, most of our friends lose their jobs that year and how that impacted people who had been so strong and who they thought they were feel so needy. And we, um, we were gripped by the need of our city. Um, So Wayne also lost his job that year, but we decided to stay because we saw that Jersey city was all the places and the people that we loved around the world. Yeah. They live here. Um, so we, we stayed and uh, we wanted to plant a church because we saw our neighborhood changing, but the church in our neighborhood wasn't serving who was actually living in our neighborhood. So we set out on that path and that's why we launched with Hope Open Grace. Um, yeah, that is awesome. Thanks for sharing that. What's your, what would you say is your favorite thing about downtown community church? Well, in one of your recent podcasts, you talked about how Hope Open Grace really is intentional about sending people out. Yeah. We consider ourselves a sending church. We're a sending church as yeah. well. And <laughs> you, have you have to... no option in, in <laughs> the New York Manhattan area because it's just such a transient area that like, if you don't adapt that sending church mentality, and what we mean by that is you know, people coming to us and trying to send them out better than how we found them. So when they get to your churches, they're ready to go. That's right. What's frustrating for some of our people is they get to their next church and people don't take them seriously. They're like, what? You want to serve already? We don't get it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we we, maybe send them with a letter of recommendation. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We live in a hyper transient neighborhood yeah. and it is urban and it's... Uh, we, two years is a long time for someone to be part of our church. Yeah. So today you chose a book all about introverts. So we're going to be talking about the book, Quiet. Why is this book personal to you? Well, I am an introvert. Okay. Um, that actually surprised me. Before we got started, I was, I told her I had to ask the question because I wasn't sure. So you, you then fake being an extrovert quite well. Well, thank you. So but I should let you answer the question. How is this personal to you? Right. I... I'm an introvert who acts like an extrovert because I care deeply about people Mm -hmm. and I love people and I love the church. So I save my energy for being around people and use it up when I'm around people. But my husband's an extrovert. So I, I, I obviously understand that there's a lot of differences between people's personalities and how they play out in ministry. But I think that, you know, some of the introverted traits that I bring to our ministry are being able to sit down with someone without needing to feel like I should be off doing something else and really hear their heart and engage with people on a deep level. Not that extroverts wouldn't do that. Yeah. Cool. And this is why Aaron also made such an excellent, so Aaron was actually a coach of mine um, back in the day uh, when she was a uh, a part of Hoboken Grace. And it was really awesome that you got to be a part of our coaches at the time were part of our core team. And it was, it was awesome to be able to get to send her out and for her to get to go start groups over at, at Jersey city and, and get those going and rolling. And, uh, and while I'm talking about core team, sorry to, to put this little nugget in here. So the lobby is actually going to be moving online this year in February. And there's some breakouts. I'm specifically doing a breakout on how to develop a core team. So one of the things I was talking about, Aaron used to be a part of my core team. And specifically, I'm going to be teaching you how we do that with volunteers and people in your church. You have people in your church that want to help your ministry be successful. And so we'll talk about how you identify them, what kind of roles you give them, and how to manage those tensions, which should be pretty good. But in addition to that, we have some really great speakers. And we are trying our best to make this online lobby as personal as possible. One of the things that is challenging about these online conferences is like, I don't know if you're like me, but when you go to online conference, I feel like I don't ever go because I'm like, I'm just going to watch it later. And then it expires by the time I finally remember to like get around to it. So one of the things we're trying to do is have lots of little breakouts mm-hmm. that's going to allow people to engage. So we'll make sure in the in the description that there's a link to to be able to join uh, the lobby. But let's get back to the book. So what made you choose this book? Uh, well, we should probably tell them the title, right? So the title yes. is Quiet Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking by Susan Cain. We have a we have a running trend on this podcast of each book has a phenomenal subtitle and this one like really just jumps out power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. So what made you choose this book? Well, it's the subtitle. No, I'm just <laughs> <kidding>. <laughs> uh, well, I, 
I love this book. I love reading about psychology. That's what I studied in college. Okay, I love cool. when people write books that are based on facts, that they've gone out and done a ton of research, that it's not just their opinion. So I I like that part of the book, but I also, I think it can put some good handles on our differences. We yeah. see differences in ministry. And I think we can be easily frustrated when people don't conform to how we need them to be. Um, and I think the understanding differences is always a great option yeah. to help us with that frustration. Yeah. I also really enjoyed about this book. The, the research side of it was great. This book is definitely academic, but not too much that you can't read it. Like, you know, those academic mm-hmm. books where you're just like, Oh my God, who are you trying to write this book for? <laughs> like, yeah. it, it was, it was super helpful in that. And I didn't get to share this earlier. I am an extreme extrovert. Like I, feel alone even when I'm with my family. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that I like need to get out, get to see people. And like, like I think my wife is also an extrovert. So when we get to a party, it's actually pretty nice. Like we just break off and then just go work the entire room until we end up back together. And it's like, all right, must be time to go home then. Like, Mm -hmm. but my wife and I just love that small talk and having people over those kind of things. So this was really good for me to get to learn more about this. And like, It also makes me really think of the people that I know in my own ministries that are introverted. And I have a few that are just superstars. And it was really nice to get to think of how I might be able to help them even more, even at a baseline of like coming out of this book, realizing like, I need to get coffee with this person and ask them more questions as to like, how can we develop this better? for Mm -hmm. you uh, in in that regard. So cool. So why don't we start with like, can you just help us define what, what an introvert is? Right. And I think the author has, she, she lays it out there and then says lots of people define introversion in many different ways and it plays out differently in each person's life. So saying that I would, I would say that introversion is gain your energy from being alone Yeah, and you have to be alone before you can invest in relationships that they introverts like to develop a few relationships and they can often find them off to the side of a party, not working the room like you and Erica, but um, (laughs) off with one person that they've been dying to have a conversation with. (laughs) And then I would say that they listen and process before sharing, which is how it impacts groups. I think in a big way. Yeah. And we probably should have shared this earlier in the podcast. We're going to be talking a lot of generalizations today about introverts and extroverts and, and know that, I mean, she talks about this in the book. It's not like all introverts are this way or all extroverts are this way or all churches are this way. So, you know, bear with us, give us a little bit of grace. Uh, we, we do think we're going to be talking to the majority. Um, one of the statistics she had in there too, is that introverts, I actually thought it was more 50, 50. She was talking about how it's a range in between one third to one half. Um, so I, I didn't realize that extrovert was like kind of a dominant kind of thing. I figured it would be more kind of 50, 50. So, and I think it is an American thing. Yeah. So this is an American book. Yeah. <laughs> and we are American churches. So I think it's okay to talk about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, well, since we're already on that topic, let's, let's talk about a little bit about our churches. She even uses Saddleback as an example in here. They went and visited, she lives in Southern California. And so naturally you're there, you're going to go check it out. And they're pretty much talking about how churches have an extroverted kind of tendency and the different things that happen within, when, within churches. Could you give us examples of what that like looks like for you as an introvert in churches, like where you feel this dominant kind of extroverted to this, this, having to adjust or or those kind of things like. Well, I think what we celebrate in our churches is what Mm. we get, which we talk about quite often. And extroversion is celebrated in churches. It's an outward example of what's going on on the inside of the person. You can see what's happening in their life. And Mm -hmm. oftentimes with an introvert, you don't get to see the growth. They're not sharing it with you. Yeah. It's quieter. So we celebrate the outward examples of faith. Yeah. And she was talking about how she really feels too that the, you know, the thing that has really influenced, you know, Western culture and specifically America to be this extrovertedness is the perception of Jesus being an extrovert. I mean, he's going to these parties, he's inviting people, he's 
He's she's completely overlooking all the times that this guy retreats for 40 days or this guy, you know, goes and seeks his solitude quite often, but that he is perceived as this ultra extrovert because he's trying to reach all these people. And then that has just completely influenced our our society. So can I just say yeah. something about that? I Go think that the perception is Jesus was an extrovert, but I would say that he is the completion of all personalities. Yes. He's the perfect version of yeah. what it means to yeah. be fully human and fully God. And it's only half the story to say that he was an extrovert. Right. Yeah. He's <laughs> I would say everything to all people, right? <laughs> everything to all people. Exactly. <laughs> What would you say are some things that are misunderstood about introverts? I would say that introverts sometimes can be portrayed as they don't have good ideas or they're not engaged or they don't care. Yeah. Um, those would be some of the negative ones. But I, I've also noticed that some introverts can appear like they're too busy mm -hmm. to attend a group, a small group, that they um, don't really want to share how they feel and that they might not be able to make an impact in other yeah. people's lives. Yeah. And, and I think one, we just talk about how that, you know, those misunderstandings then play out inside group and, and things like that. Cause I think sometimes we think that, Oh, they're being shy. Like they're not a part of the group or, you know, Oh, they don't, they don't want to hang out with us all the time on the weekends. Like these kind of things. Like I think the things where like, they're just not that interested. Like. Right. And often I think as group leaders, we can measure success by, getting the quiet person to talk. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe we should take a look at that a little bit closer. Yes. There's actually a really good blog post about this written by Andrew Camp. Um, I'll make sure that that is in the description below. But he just did a whole article on the value of connection over attendance. And I think sometimes we are so geared in towards that uh, like attendance. Are they showing up? Are they participating? All these different things. Rather than asking the question, like, are they connecting? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that can really help level the playing field when it comes to introverts and extroverts is like, okay, are they connecting? Like, in other words, they don't need to connect to everyone in the group, mm -hmm. but are there a few, maybe a few people that they're connected with? Are, are there conversations going on outside of group, those kind of things? Would you agree with that? Or That is how I measure success yeah. of a group. I that was like extrovert Nick being like, I'm going on. I think it's this. So <laughs> it's probably going to happen a lot in this podcast. That I'm is actually how I train my well. leaders. To yeah. I say that exact thing. <laughs> <laughs> how are small groups geared towards extroverts and how might we do a better job, including space for introverts? I think that groups don't have to be geared toward extroverts. I think it's however the group leader designs their yeah. particular group. And these are things that I have tried with my groups, because I wanted to, and, and no one told me to, but I think that you have to work with your leader's strengths. And if you are an extrovert leader, you should lead out of your strength. Don't try to be someone you're not. But maybe you have an introvert in your group and you want to pull them out. So th these are some tricks that I've done in my groups that have helped people who don't have a lot to say in a group say a little bit more. I think that asking people to, to think on their feet and think quickly and answer a question in a circle is a difficult thing for yeah. an introvert to do, especially something if it's personal or... That was like a big thing I learned from this book reading through. Like I didn't, I didn't realize that was an extroverted thing that like spontaneous conversation. And it's funny because like we sometimes have a script for these podcasts at least to, to go by. And like, I, I just enjoy bringing things out of nowhere and, you know, asking the questions the moment, stuff like that. And, and now I'm like subconscious of like, oh no, I'm really hurting my introvert when I go <laughs> off the script or I go, I go away from it. But, um, so I apologize about that, but, um, learning that they, they talked a lot about like public speaking in particular and how extroverts will just wing it. Mm. And everyone fears public speaking, right? And there's this misconception that extroverts aren't don't fear it, but they do just as much as the the introverts do. It's just that the introverts need time to prepare. And I thought right. that that was something that's super applicable to our small groups. In that, like sometimes I don't think that we understand the advantages of allowing our group members to prepare before they come to group. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be as simple as like, if you're a sermon based study group as to sending the questions out beforehand yep. or making a place where they can see that ahead of time. So they, they can jump in the conversation. Right. And I found that a lot of 
people who are in my dinner groups don't yeah. want the questions ahead of time. They feel like it's on homework. <laughs> Those are the people who don't need to receive the questions ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting then. Do we just like, so I have been in this struggle with that because we went there to a point where we just sent out the questions to everyone that was inside a group. And then that gets tricky because I also ask my leaders to personalize the questions. Like, you know, your group better than I do. Mm -hmm. Like, to be honest, when I write these questions with my team, we're often thinking the groups that we lead and how mm -hmm. they might best respond, but you're going to know how they respond better. So I think this is one of those things where like you want to encourage your leaders to figure out that tension and maybe they identify it's one or two people who maybe need to get these questions. Or um, is there a place you can host these questions? So for us, we, we add the discussion questions onto uh, anywhere our video is posted. Um, to, to be able to see that. I know that North Point, so either one of the churches I follow, but they will then on Sundays put their discussion questions like in their Instagram, those kind of things. Or, right. Um, and often that. a sermon will end with yeah. a, an application question. And yeah. often those application questions are in our questions. So mm -hmm. people do get a little bit of a heads up. Yeah. And I know our friends at, at North Coast too, they, they actually have those, would the dream church of being able to do your questions beforehand and have them, they have them ready to go on Sunday. Yeah. So. That's very prepared. Yeah. So. Um, but if you don't send your questions ahead of time, here are some things you can do <laughs> for the introverts in your groups. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Um, I have found that it can be beneficial to hand out a three by five card to people yeah. when it's discussion question time after the connecting phase of our time together, our eating time is over and ask either one or two questions and then give people five minutes to yeah. think and write. And honestly, it can be really awkward for people who hate that kind of thing, mm -hmm. but it opens up the conversation in a whole other way for people who really were waiting for permission to share yeah. their thoughts. I actually think that has a huge benefit to the extroverts as, as well. And again, I'm going to be speaking for extroverts, but that space that you give actually gives us a chance to filter a bit more mm -hmm. as opposed to just using everyone in the group as a sounding board. So I think that's a, that's another thing that's probably really good where we, we can tend to drown out uh, in, inside conversations and stuff like that. So are you so. saying that you share things before you know you actually think them? Oh, I share things. I don't even know that I agree with. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'll cover it up with like, if this is a bad idea, we'll just throw it away mm -hmm. kind of thing. But yeah, that's definitely and where I, I would think about it for a week or so <laughs> yes. before I say anything. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Another thing you can do if you're not into three by five guards is ask a question and have people turn to their neighbor mm. or break people up in groups of three. Yes. If two feels too intimidating. And if you want to keep the group cohesive and not just have people pair off, you could ask a question and do that. And then the next question, have them pair off with a different person. And her research actually backed this up inside the book. This is on page 88. If you have the book as well, it says some 40 years of research, the research has came to the same startling conclusion. So they have shown that performance gets worse as group size increases groups of nine generate fewer and poorer ideas compared to groups of six, which do worse than groups of four. Um, and what she was talking about was they were, the research was around brainstorming sessions, mm -hmm. but I think it's interesting hearing that as well when it comes to small groups, because, you know, one of the other things that I know it wasn't in her book, but I, I know about corporate meetings is that as soon as you have more than eight people inside a meeting, it turns from it being a, kind of conversation bouncing off each other and being kind of organic to I got to get my point in because I'm not going to be able to, it turns into points as opposed to conversations, which is something as a, our small groups that we don't want to see as well. So it's like helping our groups stay smaller mm -hmm. um, is beneficial as well. But like you're talking about with introverts, even going smaller than that and getting down to two and three. And um, I know that's super beneficial in my own group when it comes to prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, the the amount that they can share and the, the intimacy of that as well, um, right? Being beneficial. So I like the conversation about the the brainstorming because I think that um, small groups can actually be derailed. Yeah. By our version of what the brainstorming session is, which is thinking of ways to apply a certain truth to our lives. Yeah. That if you don't have someone who can be in your group pulling things back to where our source of truth comes from. It's so easy to be down that road of we're all doing something that's not biblical with our lives now. Yeah. Um, we can 
lead each other in a bad direction unless we have yeah. someone pulling us back. And one thing I think I'm going to implement from this as well that is really interesting. So Aaron and I, both, uh, both of our groups have this DNA of our small groups host social events throughout the year. And I've never been able to like, we, we've been trying to figure out like, how do we get better ideas to come out of this? And I already knew that one of the things that's been sh- a struggle for them is when they try to think of it as a group as opposed to having a small group of people or even one or two people come up with like three ideas and bring it to the group that they talk about. The groups that try to come up with an idea collectively mm-hmm. always end up with the most vanilla idea or end up with an idea that just doesn't work or they get disappointed because like, I thought we agreed on this. And it was more like, I just wanted to move on in the conversation. So I said, yes, <laughs> kind really of funny. thing. And I think that's one of the, that may be a better way to get those better ideas and, out outside of a group is, and I think that introverts would do just as well, like creating those social events, mm-hmm. like, especially when they, they give time, it was really big highlight in the book of just talking about how introverts need that space. Actually, they were talking about how extroverts need it as well. They think that they don't need it, but cause it's one of the downfalls of a, a open office environment is like getting that solitude time to get in some deep work, uh, in, inside of that. So Right. Um, so besides paring down and, and groups being smaller, anything else that would be helpful for, for groups that would really help and assist introverts? I think there's like just regular tricks yeah. that all group leaders should do. Sit across from the quietest person. Mm. Whoever's the quietest needs your eye contact. Whoever is the most talkative does not need your eye contact. They will speak yeah. no matter what. Sit next to them. I think that we can ask people, like you said, sending questions ahead of time to everybody sometimes can work sometimes can't work if you know that you have a super thoughtful person who is growing in a certain way and you would love them to share that in your group you can ask them ahead of time Mm -hmm. to talk about it you can invite them to come five minutes early ten minutes early before your group starts And you can actually talk about that question with them the 10 minutes before your group starts and then say, would you be willing to share this tonight? I think people could really benefit from hearing this from you. Yeah. And one of the things I also teach in case it's not obvious that if you ask someone to do something like that, always follow up with them afterwards and thank them and affirm them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously be honest about it. But like, it's so helpful when they get it on the other side. Because often when we're asking them to do these things, it's not because we want something from them. Right. We want something for them. Mm-hmm. And I think that was another thing uh, in, inside the book that was really helpful too, was, was talking about how introverts, introverted leaders do a really great job of leading extroverts and extrovert leaders can do a really good job of leading introverts. And I thought that was pretty interesting talking about how like the yin and the yang of that of you know, the the introverted leader being able to help extroverted people, you know, think deeper, do more um, thought ahead of time, those kind of things. And then the extroverted leader trying to pull the introverts a little bit further, like outside of the comfort zone Mm -hmm. in a healthy way that I thought was was really interesting. So, you know, we've covered a lot of small groups. And I I think that we've talked a lot about how this applies, like outside of COVID times, right? Mm-hmm. And now that we're in like month seven of this, if or eight or nine, I don't even know where we're at anymore, but it almost feels like we're never going to get to the other side of it. But what does this then look like inside of the online groups? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it can be challenging to have conversations in a Zoom meeting mm-hmm. that are kind of, everybody is all in on the conversation. Yeah. And they can be more of a corporate feel to them where one person is in charge and facilitating the conversation. I think that it takes a lot more calling people out in that setting. I haven't found a way for that to be successful. Have you? Um, I only can know how my group is doing on this one, which is really challenging. Although I guess to be fair, I could do a better job of asking my leaders what they're experiencing, but I have found that I just have to call on people more. Mm -hmm. And I've been leading online connection events as well. And I, my, my strength and strength finders uh, talk about another personality thing. I'm a connector. And so part of my like small talk conversation is 
I'm actually trying to help them find someone that they're going to connect well to. Um, and so in, inside that process, like I'm constantly trying to link things together, but I notice I have to call out like, Hey, what do you think about this? And, and I actually, one of the things I really love about the online environment is getting to see everyone's face at the same time mm-hmm. so that I can get those cues much easier. Yeah. But I do find that like inside my own group, the extroverts are the first ones to jump in on, on those kind of questions. And I'm always the, the introverts are the last two to go mm-hmm. always. And I never know whether I need to move on to the next question or whether I need to call them out to say, yep. Hey, what I've had a similar this? experience of yeah. not knowing, are they wanting to share or do they want me to move on? I have found the only thing that I have found to be successful in helping this is the personal chat on the side where you're not chatting everybody. You just oh. chat the one introvert. Hey, do you want to share about your mom who had that thing happen? We'd all love to hear about that if you're willing to. Wow. Um, so if you can chat one person in a way that your group doesn't see you not engaging. Yeah. That's one thing that's worked. Awesome. Anything else online wise that we're not thinking of? I think what you said earlier is connection happens outside of group. Yeah. That we, that is something that can still happen. Yeah. Cool. Um, mm, 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 mm. Okay. So let's, let's think about, um, what's the way to bring this in here? Um, Okay, so the, the next thing I'd like to talk about is connecting introverts into a group. So they haven't yet found their group. Mm-hmm. What, are those, what are some of the best practices you've found around assimilating someone into a, a group that's an introvert? Well, I think that a personal invite from a friend is still the greatest way to get anyone in a group. Mm-hmm. And second to that would be meeting somebody on a Sunday who is a group leader and connecting them. You and I both love to connect people. And yeah. there's this culture of our gatherings where we at the end connect people to each other. So I would say that that would be the second way. And then if someone just does a cold sign up online, it could be a little bit more challenging because you don't really know anything about them. Yeah. This was, as soon as like this question came out of my mouth, I was like, you have no idea whether they're introvert or extrovert anyways. Right. So I'm just trying to think, you know, what are some of those ways? I think it's almost that we assume that they're introverted potentially that would make them feel more comfortable. So I don't like, I think it's having that connection ahead of time right? and figuring out a way to, to be able to say hello. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes it a little bit more personal as opposed to like, I think it comes back to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but introverts want to know the environment that they're going to be stepping into. And so helping them understand like ahead of time, Hey, this is what you could kind of expect or like, I'll make sure to introduce you to the group or the, uh, would, right. is that helpful? Or is that hurtful? I think that's helpful to okay. know at least one person. I think it could be overwhelming yeah. if, well, you need to know all eight of us before <laughs> you can come. A rule that I have for myself is if somebody cold call cold signs up online, yeah, I have coffee with them. Yeah. And in the COVID environment, that means a phone call or a zoom meeting mm-hmm. that we are still, at a size where I can do that with everyone who signs up. Yeah. I want them to know what our groups are, what they're not. I want to get to know them a little bit Yeah, and make them feel that being part of one of our groups is actually them serving our church too. Mm -hmm. It's not just about what they can get, but it's about how they can serve and love other other people. Yeah. That's great. Anything we need to know about introverted leaders? I think introverted leaders can work outside their capacity For only so long. Interesting. That they will, in purpose of a mission, do whatever it takes. Yeah. Until they can't do it anymore. And that I don't know that this would be true for all introverts, but they need permission to do what actually fuels them. Yeah. So they may be healthy enough that they are doing that on their own. Yeah. Um, But as leaders of leaders, I think we should assume that people need some encouragement in that. So as leaders of leaders, we shouldn't be encouraging people. How are you restoring your soul? Mm -hmm. How are you taking time out, feeding yourself and nurturing who you are as a person so that you have your whole self going into your, your leadership? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting that you say that because one of the other things that's unique about the group system at Hoboken Grace is that it doesn't stop. It mm-hmm. just goes. Uh, and part of that is the unique culture that we're in. 
because people have left their families to come live here. Yep. And so we are their families. And so when we say, take a break, it's literally like us saying, stop seeing your family. Yep. And in 2020, you can see what happens when you say, stop seeing your family mm -hmm. <laughs> and how much that, that hurts. It does. <laughs> but I think sometimes I neglect inside that of how much the leader might actually need that rest period. Um, and, and so that might be another thing I need to probably work on to think of, you know, how, how do I help them refuel um, so they can continue to be the best leader uh, possible? Yeah. And I think it's even more than our seasonal breaks. Yeah. It's modeling how to Sabbath yep. ourselves. It's talking about that in a way that's accessible to people who've never done it, mm -hmm. who work 12 hours a day, six days a week, yep. how they do in our area. <laughs> How, what does rest look like for them? And then they're supposed to also take on their own spiritual formation. That can be overwhelming to any leader, let yeah. alone an introverted leader. Yeah. And this book will do a really great job too. Uh, we won't go into this, but this book does a great job too of telling them how their work environment is wearing them out. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from inside that as well. But taking that into the equation of like, they're, they're doing this over here, the, they're doing the, they're doing the groups because they love it, right? But group is, or but work is just wearing them down. Yeah, Aaron, this was super ins insightful. Anything else we may have missed? I mean, I think we could talk about this a long time, but yes. we want to be <laughs> honor is, people's time. This is how here. we know it's time to wrap up. Is is I think each podcast we go, man, there's so much more that we could talk about, right? <laughs> Which is totally true. Uh, and one of the things I just love about uh, getting to doing to talk about these books and I'm glad I finally have an outlet for this. Yes. Um, but now I'm, I'm sad that there's a time constraint on them, but sorry, I, I kind of cut you off on that. Was there something else that you were going to say? No, I think if it's not, great. I, have one. I think that there's always more to learn about ourselves. Yes. And that it influences how we lead. Yeah. I think one other thing that I wanted to talk about that I really enjoyed from this book and it's literally been a theme of all of our podcasts but everyone does better when they know their purpose and their role. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, she wrote that as like introverts want to know that mm -hmm. everyone wants to know that. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's been the theme in tribe and that's been the theme in in extreme ownership. And that's been the theme yeah. in all these things is that, that you need to, you need to know your purpose. And so I think one of our, I think one of the things that we have to do inside as, as point people mm -hmm. in this is how people find and identify their purpose. Mm -hmm. And just also like, I know it's annoying, at least for myself, but like coming up with those role descriptions for your team members and those kind of things can be kind of challenging, but it's so helpful for them to know like, okay, this is my role in this team. And um, I just thought that that was super helpful to like, here it is again. So it'll be interesting to see if it comes up in the next book, but Okay, let's move on to our lightning round. What is another book that you've read recently that's had an impact on your leadership? The Power of Proximity. Yeah. And in my city, every neighborhood has a totally different vibe. And the people who live in our neighborhood where our church meets are completely different from the majority of the rest of the city. And it has been eye-opening for me to think through how to mobilize people to care outside of the four blocks that they live in mm -hmm. and how they can have an influence on all of the city and the needs that they see and use their, their wealth, their capacity to look outside themselves yeah. and leave a legacy beyond the two years that they live here. Mm -hmm. That sounds awesome. Does does that also have a great subtitle? These always have good subtitles. It does. The subtitle is Moving Beyond Awareness to Action. Oh. It basically it's saying don't be a slacktivist. Yeah. If that's not a leadership uh, uh, training that you have in the future, moving beyond awareness to action. Our goals of our groups. We don't just want you to talk about it and be aware mm -hmm. of it. We want you to actually become these things that we're talking about and take a step of faith. So, yep. uh, and then what's one book you're looking forward to? A book about friendship. We, we should get together is the title. And it also has a subtitle, the secret to cultivating better friendships. Mm -hmm. It's also research based. Okay. And it studies loneliness, okay. which I think is a huge problem in our city. Oh, and, totally world. Um, the whole, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, making, we talked about with Tommy on the last episode, like mm -hmm. that's how we came to talk about training our group members to be group members. One of the things Tommy does is he tries to teach them how to be friends. Yeah. So, 
And I think that we don't know how to be friends with people that we don't naturally have yes. um, an affinity for or a proximity to. Yeah. Well, that sounds like one I'm probably going to need to add to my shelf as well and definitely call you up for coffee once I finish yeah. that as well. So, sounds good. Uh, Aaron, truly is a, pr- a pleasure as always. Thank you for being here. I'm Nick Lindsay, and I want to thank you for listening with us today. Thanks, Aaron, for sharing your experiences. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Reading Lens will be back next month with Daniel Thomas from Community Church of Mountain City in Mountain City, Tennessee. And for you Pixar fans, we'll be covering the highly recommended book, Creativity, Inc., which is, uh, again, great subtitle. Here it comes. Overcoming the unseen forces that stand in the way of true inspiration. Um, I wonder if it'll also talk about open offices. <laughs> I think it probably will. <laughs> so remember, leaders are readers. Take care, everyone. <laughs>